My name is Sam Eifling, and this month I will graduate with a, a master's in journalism from UBC. And while I was here, I also participated in what's called the International Reporting Program, in which students report and produce a documentary somewhere in the world that then winds up with uh, major media partners such as Al Jazeera, or the New York Times, or the CBC or Frontline. And today I'm going to tell you a story. It involves international reporting, a land dispute in Brazil, and murder. Now, on those last points, there was another TED talk uh, involving these, these points. A man named Zé Claudio Ribeiro de Silvas. In November of 2010, he gave a, a talk in Manaus, Brazil, which is the big city in the middle of the Amazon, in which he stood up against the illegal loggers and charcoal makers who were cutting down trees and burning trees that he used to sustainably farm nuts and for oil, basically. Uh, this was incredibly brave on his part. And it, because in Brazil, which is much of it so vast and unpoliceable and, and almost the Wild West in many ways, there's been a lot of violence around resource extraction and land rights. If you go back to the 80s, there have been, depending on how you count, perhaps hundreds of murders uh, involving issues of this sort. And there is a Catholic charity, in, or an NGO actually, in Brazil that uh, keeps what is, we came to call the, the death list. It's, it's people who are under death threats, largely for standing up in the way that he was, not necessarily as an environmental activist, but as a, a community advocate. He knew the danger, and he said so at the TED Talk. He said, any day I could wind up with a bullet in my head. And six months after that, he did. He and his wife were on a back road near their small town, and, uh, and they were shot and killed. So as, we, as my class was looking at, uh, at this milieu in Brazil, these, these conflicts around resources and, and often indigenous people or, or just private citizens of this sort, uh, we saw his case, and uh, we, we started looking into the, the pattern of violence there. As we were studying this, in November of 2011, there was another murder. It was in a state in the south of Brazil called Mato Grosso do Sul, which is very different from the Amazon, Brazil being very large as many climate zones. But there were some of the similar hallmarks of, of killings like, say, Claudio's. In this case, an indigenous leader named Nicio Gomez had led his people, his Guarani tribe, onto a farm where they claimed ancestral right. And two weeks after that, according to reports, People broke onto the farm, targeted him, killed him, or at least shot him, took his person. It wasn't known whether he was alive or dead, and took him away. Um, Mato Grosso do Sul is more or less the breadbasket of Brazil. There are a lot of cash crops there, uh, cattle, soy, corn, and uh, there are large farming interests. And the farming interests said, this is, this is a political attack. This is a hoax. This is for attention. And the indigenous people we talked to said, no, we think he was killed. And so with that tension in mind, we, three students and a professor, uh, decided in February to go ahead and make that a stop on our, our trip to Brazil. So you might be asking right now, what are university students in Vancouver doing investigating murders of indigenous tribal leaders in South America? And part of that has to do with the priorities of this school, which has made international reporting uh, a focus. And there's also a large donor who supports generously this program, which is not cheap to run. But part of that has to do with the state that we find in international reporting in now, generally, globally. It's extremely expensive, and, and as I'm sure everybody knows, media companies have been cutting back in many ways. One of those ways, easy cuts, are to foreign bureaus. And uh, along with that, to the budgets that used to support freelancers around the world. So there is this gap that we're all experiencing without even knowing it, of, of reporting from around the world. That gap can't stand. Information wants to move into it. Now, the sources of those information may be, uh, may be NGOs, it may be governments, it may be corporations, it may be hobbyists. It'll, it'll be somebody talking about the world to other people. But I want to suggest to you here that it really takes reporting. It takes journalism and it takes feet on the ground in order to tell the stories that are going to motivate the world that we live in right now. So we went to, uh, we went to this farm. We went to, it was a stubbly patch of, of cleared soy next to a forest, and the village that we visited was really nothing more than a, a series of, of huts made of thatch fortified with plastic sheeting. Uh, chickens were running in and out of the instrument, but people were, were very friendly and welcomed us very nicely. Uh, we found, for instance, that when we talked to the one witness that we could, we could find, it was a, a nephew of Nisio's, 
that uh, he described an early morning attack in which maybe four gunmen came onto the farm. We had read another report, something like 40, um, which was a discrepancy that, that's worth noting. Um, he described seeing his uncle shot and the body taken as family members fled. And as he was telling us this, he's, he's showing us the weapons that he has created to defend himself in the case of such attacks. They're arrows that look like to us like sticks with a nail in it held with inner tube from a bicycle tire. It's, it's totally not up to the job. This gentleman in the center is Nisio's son. And he told us that they weren't going to move. They were going to stay. The families were going to stay. They, they be believed the land was theirs. And there was, uh, yet he, he feared that now that he was the head of the tribe, that he, he could be targeted next. Um, this makes a great story in many ways. I mean, we have all these incredible dramatic elements, right? Um, but as journalists, we don't want to tell that story. We want to find as many conflicting stakeholders as we can and figure out what is the broader truth that we can draw from it. So we did our best to get contact the landholders at that farm. Uh, they wouldn't talk to us. But we did find another ranch uh, not far from there that uh, had experienced some of the same difficulties. And the landowners, they were very happy to talk to us because they also had a stake in this. Uh, going back to 1998 is when they received what they called this invasion. And the family was getting ready for Christmas. Uh, everybody's in the house. They're baking, doing whatever people do. The father of the house busts in and says, guys, we got to get out of here. The Indians are coming. There are hundreds of them. We have to run. And they fled through the woods that night. When they came back, there was a squatter camp. And that squatter camp is still there 14 years later. Um, as you can imagine, there's been a lot of conflict having this sort of tension as the, as the Brazilian courts have taken it up and government anthropologists have tried to determine who's, maybe whose land this, this belongs to. And they've complained about cattle who have been killed, vandalism. The father of the house uh, was attacked one night and we saw pictures of him bloodied. And at one point there was actually uh, one of the Guarani uh, got into a, a conflict with the security forces that are hired there and he was shot in the chest and he died. So, you might ask at this point, why is all this happening? And to answer that, I have to do something that's a little bit Brazilian. We found this, as we're trying to do a TV piece, one of the things you need is sound bites. And it's really difficult going across languages and doing this. And culturally, there are some problems too, because we would ask a question like, can you tell us about the situation as it is in Brazil today, the conflict here? And it didn't matter who it was. Indigenous people, farmers, federal prosecutors, they would start with some answer that began like, well, when Christopher Columbus arrived, and we'd say, okay, that's not, that's not going to help us. But I do have to go, I, I'm not going to go that far back, but I do have to go some distance back. Essentially, about 150 years ago, Paraguay, which is right on the border with that state, Mato Grosso do Sul, and Brazil were in a, a catastrophic war. And as part of the result of this, Brazil realized that its frontier was unguarded. Mostly it was full of native peoples who would wander around and move from place to place, and there was no permanent fortification in the government's mind against perhaps another invasion. So, and this will sound familiar to people who are from North America, uh, the government started assigning land to farmers, selling it to them, getting them on there, essentially white farmers who would not only be productive with the land, but also serve as a military bulwark. There was a national security aspect of this, there was an economic interest, but of course what happens is the people who were used to roaming from place to place and living very simply are displaced. Some of them go to urban areas, and we found them there still. Uh, without land and without ties there, many of them have been in poverty for decades. And one federal prosecutor told us that uh, in the 1930s, many of the, the natives were herded into places he, he called concentration camps, that recently, dire circumstances. Brazil realized its problems, and in the 1980s drafted a constitution that, that was at the time one of the most progressive in terms of indigenous rights in the world. It said no longer can the government displace indigenous peoples if they've lived in a place. No longer can they, can they just push them around. But what it didn't really do is spell out exactly what would happen in the event that someone tested that law. So you get situations such as the 90s, such as this family that we visited. It says these, these natives just moved here. They'd owned, the, they'd owned the farm for three generations. But there was a much more distant claim by these groups who may have had a, a perfectly legitimate claim in that way. Now, for a group to move onto a farm like this, it's a very high stakes proposition, of course. 
it's natural that they would try to be repelled by force. And, but if they, if they stay there and, and stick it out, they might win the land. Farmers hate this, not only because it disrupts everything that they're doing, but because there's no provision in current Brazilian law to pay them for that land. So if, if anthropologists came in, and even after a slow-moving bureaucracy in Brazil decides, here's this land, it can go to you, the farmers are totally out. They might be compensated for the value of any capital improvements that are made on the land, a house or something. But we were not able to find a single instance in which that had happened, of hundreds of cases in Mato Grosso do Sul where they had been these invasions. So you can see from a sort of rational, capitalistic perspective how there would be tension and how this could erupt in violence. The story gets more interesting, of course, right? So this goes to another aspect of, of why I think journalism is important we found that a more compelling story. And in fact, one of the most interesting things for us was finding similarities and views between these two groups. Everybody was really hacked off at the Brazilian state about this situation. Farmers, indigenous, it was universal. And specifically at an agency called FUNAI. Now, FUNAI has domain over indigenous affairs within Brazil. And we were going to talk to FUNAI, that was it. And we had tried to organize something with FUNAI before we went to Brazil, but it was the week of Carnival. The people we really wanted to talk to were going to be on vacation. It was a big mess. But what happened after that, I think, is another reason why uh, international reporting has some difficulty right now, which is that it's risky. And we ran into some of these risks. It was the last day we were there of the week that we were reporting. It was a Friday. We are hot to visit FUNAI. We are calling FUNAI. We're saying, we are dropping by. Somebody's going to give us a quote. We're going to talk to somebody. We're just running and gunning, driving around Brazil, right? So we show up at this office, and it's clear nobody wants to talk to us. In fact, they look like they just want to wait us out. So we're going to wait them out. We're loitering in the lobby, trying to be as charming as we can. When you say you're from Canada, people automatically see you as less of a threat. So of course, we're mentioning Canada over and over. And eventually, they sort of drag us up to this conference room. Uh, there are three students, a professor, a driver, and a translator. And they sit down. and. I, they can't really give us any good answers. They pull out a map and they say, where have you been? Who have you talked to? Uh, what farms have you been to? And we're guiding them through and, and telling them where, where we've been. But it's pretty clear, maybe there's some jurisdictional problems. Maybe we're not even in the right office. It doesn't seem like anybody's qualified to talk to us. And just then, rain starts pouring down on what apparently is the sheet metal roof above us. It sounds like we're sitting in a snare drum. Any audio we get is going to be just trash. So. Right then, my professor's leaning over and saying, guys, this is, we need to get out of here. This is pointless. Let's just go to the hotel. And the door opens. And who's behind us but federal police officers. And the federal police officers say, we need to see your documents. And we're thinking, OK, well, all right. And so we hand over our passports. And they say, you all need to come with us. So here we are, 3 o'clock on a Friday, being dragged now to the federal police station in Dorados, Mato Grosso do Sul, because we don't know why. We thought it might have to do with perceived trespassing. There, there are a lot of laws around who can go onto which indigenous areas and, and, and when, but we thought we were in the clear. We thought we were fine. They proceed to hold us, take statements from us, uh, get the entire list of who we were, what we were doing, get our entire travel history. They want to copy our footage, which we say fine, because there's no point because of the codex and the footage. They could copy it, but they'd need all kinds of software to get it. So we say, yeah, sure, take our footage. And we were on the phone. We are on the phone with the Canadian consulate with allies we have in the Brazilian government, with UBC, which scrambled, by the way. They do not want to hear students detained in a federal police station <laughs> in Brazil. Even if it's during reading week, there was a, a panel of VPs convened immediately on our behalf. Um, and as this was going on, it came to light that they thought we were there on bad visas. They had gotten a tip from somewhere. I'd like to point out that the only people who knew where we were going to be were in that office, that Funai government office. They got a tip from somewhere that we were there on bad visas which is fantastic because we hadn't shown our visas to anybody. There was no reason for anybody to have suspected us of anything except they didn't want to talk to us. So we were held for six hours, well past the business day, and it looked like they won the waiting game, right? Like we did not get to talk to Funai. And uh, lo and behold, we actually, there, were, there was a scrum of journalists outside waiting for us. Uh, your Portuguese is probably about as good as mine, but that's actually uh, the students and, uh, and our professor making the paper the next day and which was not what we wanted. We did not want a high profile when we went through all this stuff. But it went to part of the reason why I think this, this practice is going to a place 
beyond the logistics, beyond the travel, is just risky and it's tricky. And it, that episode really threatened our entire project. But we came back, we worked for a few weeks, we wrote, we edited, finally our piece goes up on the New York Times site. Uh, it's a short documentary that, that you can find there now. And uh, we were sort of surprised at the reaction that we got. It was, people in Brazil were surprised to see us when we went. They didn't realize that what was going on there was in fact a world story, even though the UN had, had written about it and, and it had the attention of, of human rights groups around the world. They just saw it as something that was happening in Brazil. And when we arrived, they thought, wow, this is quite fascinating that this is actually something that Canadians are pursuing. Uh, what was even more interesting than that, though, was the reaction we got from Canadians who saw this piece and saw the relationship, the very strained relationship between land rights, resource use, and the indigenous. And Canadians could hear something of, of their situation, of British Columbia's situation, in that, in that milieu, granted, without the violence. It wasn't parallel, but, but there was a rhyme. A couple of weeks after this, too, we were sort of surprised and, and happy to find that uh, authorities in that state made a series of arrests in this killing. They treated it as a killing, not as a hoax, and even, even without a body. So it showed us, perhaps, that although we have no regulatory power, we have no power of law enforcement as journalists, all we can do is present a conversation and move the conversation along. And I maybe think that knowing that the world was watching and that that conversation was taking pl place in offices like the New York Times and around the world might have moved what otherwise has been a, a pretty lousy track record of, of making arrests in these cases. So what I'd like to leave you with here is a thought on how to continue that conversation, the conversation that it, it does take journalists to hold. The best thing you can do is just give your attention. If you see good work, Facebook it, tweet it, send it to people, comment on it. Tell media organizations that that's what you want to see. When people invest in hard, expensive reporting, reward them for that. I submit to you that as much as we hear about the world getting smaller, it's not. It's getting bigger. Seven billion people and fewer journalists to cover it. So if there's anything that you can do, take your attention and use it wisely. Don't give it, invest it, because this might be the result. Thank you.